I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on. To reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Father, I pray today that you would open your word to us. You would open our minds and our hearts and our ears to hear what you want to say. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, because you are our rock, and our redeemer. And you have something to say to us today, as you do every week when we gather. As we intentionally submit ourselves to your Holy Spirit's work in the room over these next few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> that video you just saw is probably about as close to modern day characterization or illustration that I could find of these verses that Paul wrote so many years ago. I press on towards the goal in the race. I'm moving upward. I'm moving onward toward higher ground. Yeah, life has hit me. Life has knocked me down, but I'm moving on. Yes, I'm pressing on. So I want to ask you a question today. Actually, I want to do an exercise. Now, if you are not able um, <clears throat> to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, then you don't have to do this. But some of you might need to do that a little bit. So I'm going to just uh, invite you to do this exercise with me. Okay, so um, <clears throat> first question I have for you is all of those in the room who say, I want to know Jesus, and I want to know him more, I want you to stand up. And if you don't, that's okay. If you're here and you're an unbeliever and you're just looking, that's all good. All right. If you would say, sit down. <clears throat> you only have to do this. We're not going to do this the whole sermon, so it's good. <laughs> if you would say, okay, I want to know Jesus, I want to know him more, and I also want to know the power, I want to know and experience the power that raised him from the dead. Resurrection power. If you want to know that and experience that, and you're in the room today, stand to your feet. If that's you. I mean, you better. If you have anything invested in eternity, all right, good, <clears throat> sit down. If you would say today, <clears throat> just two more. If you would say today, not only do I want to know Jesus, I want to know the power, his, the, the power that raised him from the dead. I want to know that resurrection power in my life. I need that. But if you would also say today, Yes, I want to know those things. And I want to suffer with Jesus the way he suffered. Stand to your feet today. Good. At least you're honest. <clears throat> you can sit down. If you would say... <clears throat> I want to share in his death. I want to die and share in his death. Stand to your feet today. <clears throat> Very good. Sit down. Thank you for being honest. 
The things I gave to you <clears throat> are the verses that serve as the precursor to the passage I just wrote to you. When Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, I want to know Christ. We all agree. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. You all agreed and affirmed. He goes on to say, I want to suffer with him. All but one in the room apparently are not there. He goes on to say, I want to share in his death. All but one in the room apparently are not there. He says all of these things so that one way or another, no matter what it takes, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Philippians 3, 10 and 11 you can pretty much say are the basic characteristics of the Christian life. And in the room today, by show of your illustration, we are 50%. 50% Christian, two out of four. Those are the basic characteristics when Christ says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's it right there. The problem is, you don't get the glory. You don't get the intimacy without the suffering. And you don't get the resurrection power without the death. You can't have two. And not get the other two. So you have to choose. The Christian life is not a compartment. It is not a compartment that is reserved. That we go to in reservation just in times of crisis. When we need something. When life has fallen apart. It's not a compartment for just Christmas and Easter. It is all or nothing. It is your entire life. It will require all of you. It is not void of suffering, trial, heartache, difficulty. And yes, it's full of joy. It's full of things beyond what this world can offer. All the things we know and believe and want. But it's also filled with the trial and the suffering. And yes... Even death. It ain't no cakewalk. It is not easy. It is not just a compartment. It will require all of you. And that is exactly the way the author of this book designed it. It's intentional. Being that today you're two out of four, let me give you some comfort. Let me give you a verse that serves as perhaps one of the most set your mind at ease verses in all of Scripture. This will, in case you're feeling bad about what just happened, let me just set your mind at ease. Because Paul says... All these things, these basic characteristics of the Christian life, this is what I want. But verse 12 of Philippians 3, he says, But I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Now listen to that real close. 
He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, share in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. But he goes on the very next verse to write. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things. Or that I've already reached perfection. In other words, Paul says... I'm not there. He has no problem admitting his shortcomings, his failures, his difficulties. He has, here here is the apostle, the super apostle, the one that God used to write much of our New Testament. I mean, if there's the one who said, look at me. The way I live my life, you live your life like that. The one who's writing these things from a prison, the worst of circumstances, and he can still say that. But yet, he says, I have not achieved these things yet. In other words, I'm not there. I am a work in progress. The thing I want to let you know today Two out of four, Christian. It's okay to be a work in progress. It is okay. You need to hear this today. Some of you, it is okay to not be okay. You need to just close your eyes and hear that right now. That's what Paul's saying. I have not arrived. I'm a work in progress. Just absorb that right now. Close your eyes. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay if you're not there yet. It's okay. Some of us don't like the way we look. We don't like the way we act. We don't like some of the things. It's okay to not be okay. Some of us are trying so hard. And some of you, that's the very thing that keeps you from volunteering and serving in so many of the outreach events we just spoke of or ministry events that make the church tick and go round. Because you're still trying to be okay. You still think you've got to live up to a certain level. I I need you to understand. It is okay to not be okay. You can be broken and still be beautiful you can be broken and still be a blessing you need to hear that today i brought with me today these all these things right here and this is just a few of them but i'm sure every parent has these but these are just Things that I've kept, letters that I've kept, pictures, writing. Things like this. All of these things are letters and cards written to me by my kids. If I were to let you look at them, you would notice the artwork is not a masterpiece. In many ways, it's unfinished product. Some of them were even written on the very day that they found out just hours before it was actually my birthday. Oh, really? And run to their room. Where are the crayons? (laughs) They are unfinished pieces. There are misspelled words. They will never be displayed in any performance hall or art hall. I'll never be able to sell them off for any money. They are broken, fragmented pieces of just jumble. They are broken. But to me, they are beautiful. There is no price you can put on this. They are broken, but to me, they are a blessing. That's the way God looks at you. You need to know that today. You can be broken. And still be a blessing. 
It's okay to not be okay. Paul says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But here's the part you really need to hear now. There's a part two of that. He says, but, listen now, there's a big but in the Bible here. He says, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. In other words, I'm not okay. I'm, I have not arrived. But this you better know. I'm pressing on. I'm moving up. See, it's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to be satisfied with not being okay. You need to know that. Because it's okay to not be okay as long as you're progressing out of not okay. See, you got to be doing something about not okay. You got to be making progress. Paul says, I haven't achieved these things, but I'm pressing on. I'm not there, but I'm moving there. I'm moving that way. If okay is here and not okay is here and I'm not okay, I'm not heading towards not okay, languishing in not okay. No, 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 no. I'm moving toward okay because I'm pressing on because I got to go. I got something in mind. See, some of you are going to hear me say today, it's okay to not be okay. And that's true. You can be broken and be a blessing. But some of you are going to take that and you're going to, you're going to say, well, now the preacher said it's okay to not be okay. So I think I'm just going to lay here in all my not okayness and everyone's just going to have to deal with me not being okay. I'm going to keep being lazy. I'm going to stay in my addictions. I'm going to stay in my strife and I can still be beautiful this way and I'm going to be a leech off of everybody else around me. That's not what I'm saying. It's okay to not be okay as long as you're pressing on and upward to higher ground. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So I'm not okay, but I'm pressing on. I'm moving. I'm moving away from not okay. You need to hear that today. Don't use verse 12 as an excuse to be lazy. To stay where you are or to be a leech. That's not what he's saying. He's given us great comfort. It's okay to not be okay, but you still got to be pressing on. And he says, I press on to possess that per perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. In other words, why do we press on? Because Jesus first pressed on. You press on because he pressed on first. He's achieved something. Look, look at that right there. He says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Jesus already set the example for pressing on. We press on because he pressed first. And that perfection that he possessed for us was salvation. It was redemption. But you need to also know Christ Jesus has possessed something for you. That is why you get up. That's why when you are knocked down, you get up and you keep pressing forward because he has something for you. It means your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. Look at it right there. He says, Christ Jesus first possessed me. It means your life has meaning. It means when you were nothing but a thought in the womb of your mother, he has a place for you to be, a place for you to go, and a thing for you to do. That's why it's incredibly tragic when people give up. It's incredibly tragic when people commit suicide because Christ Jesus had possessed something for that person. It's incredibly tragic when you give in to your addictions and you stop fighting. It's incredibly tragic when you just accept mediocre. When you accept being a failure. But not only is it tragic, it's blasphemous to the work of God. He has possessed something for you. 
He pressed on first so that you might press on. So you get up and you get moving. It doesn't matter how fast, how slow. You can still be broken and be a blessing, but you press on because Christ Jesus pressed on for you. He's got some place for you to be, some place for you to go, and he's got something for you to do, and you need to get there. You need to know that today. Your life is not without meaning. It is not without purpose. You were not meant to stay in a pit and waller around in the muck and the mire of this life. He's got something for you, and it's on higher ground. Get up. Get moving. Press on. He possessed that for you. He says, no, verse 13, dear brothers and sisters. Again, he emphasizes, I've not achieved it. I'm not there. I'm a work in progress. But I focus on this one thing. Now notice, if you've got your Bibles, you'll want to underline that little phrase, one thing. He says, I'm focused on one thing and one thing only. That is being like Jesus. Did you know that's why you're created? You know that's your purpose in life? Do you know that's why you're here? I know a lot of us have priorities. We have goals. Some of you may want to be the greatest chef, the greatest fisherman, the greatest athlete. Maybe you want to be the greatest realtor or the greatest seller or the greatest businessman. And those things are all great. It's great to have goals. Jesus is not just one out of ten goals in your life. He is not one of five dreams. He is not one of three compartments. He's the only one. He is the ultimate. He is the one thing. He is the thing that your life is built upon. He's not just Sunday. He's not just weddings. He's not just funerals. He's every single day, every single moment. That's why he said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. You make that your ambition. Paul says, one thing. I focus on one thing and one thing only. That's the only, every day you get up, focus on Jesus. Jesus, today, how can I be more like you? That's the only goal in life. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But then he said, and then all these other things will be added unto you. In other words, make Jesus the priority. And see how everything else falls in line. You can still be the greatest chef. You can still be the greatest businessman. But you got to make Jesus first. When you put everything into order, things fall into place. Many of you are asking, why is my life so messed up? Why is my life so mixed up? Why is my life so out of order? Put Jesus at the top. And see what happens. But don't forget the four characteristics either. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. And here's an incredibly freeing statement. You need to hear this one. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I forget the past. And I look to what lies ahead. Leaving what's behind and straining forward, I'm pressing on to what's ahead. See, the problem for so many of us is we can't press on. We can't move forward because all the stuff in the past, in our past, decisions we made, things we did, relationships we broke off, people we're still mad at, people we still haven't forgiven, all those things are still holding us back. Many of you are here today and you can't move forward Because the stuff in your past is still beating you up. Paul says, forget what is behind. Strain forward to what lies ahead. You have to leave that stuff alone and move forward. Let it go. I'm teaching, well... Trying to teach my oldest son, Jaden, how to drive. We get in the car. We've been in the car one time. Much to the dismay of my wife, we actually went out on the road. She said, what are you doing? You're crazy. I said, listen, see that thing right there? That's called a rear view mirror. 
And it hangs on a thing called a front windshield. Now, Jake, this you need to understand. Bear in mind the things in the rearview mirror. They have value. They will, in many, you need to be aware of what's behind you. Because it will set a course for how you move forward with what's ahead. But listen, do not focus merely on what's behind you. The rear view mirror is this big. If you focus only on that, you will have a wreck. If you focus only on the things that are behind you, you will never get to where you need to go. There is this vast front windshield that you have to focus on. Look out the front windshield. Glance, be aware, learn from what's behind you, but focus on what's ahead. That's why the front windshield's so big and the rear view mirror is so small. Many of us need to see our lives that way. You're driving and the only thing you're looking at is the rear view mirror. Have you noticed there's a front windshield in front of you filled with promise? You need to focus on what's ahead. Quit driving just looking in the rear view mirror. It's like a boat. Many of you are walking. Many of us, and listen, I, I'm like this. Show me rear view mirror or rear boat. The stern, right? Many of us, that's how we do life. Now, you've got to be pressing this way, but many of us are like this right here. That's how many of us, and before you know it, you, you fall off the edge. And you're like me. See, you got decisions back there. Decisions you made in high school that you still regret. Decisions you made in college you still regret. Decisions you made in your 20s and your 30s that you still regret. And if you're like me, I got decisions I made just this week that I still regret. But you can't stay looking out the back. You got to change your perspective. You can't live here. I have to remind myself, Mark, get off the back of the boat. Move to the front. Show me front. You got to move to the front. When you find yourself drifting to the back, do what I do. Mark, get to the front. Mark, run to the front. Mark, leave. Learn from the back, but leave it behind. Run. Some of you need to say that to yourselves today, right now. Get to the front. Get to the front. Get to the front. There is too much in front of you. There is too much good. God can still redeem what happened in the rear. Get to the front. Run to the front. He says, forgetting the past, I look forward to what lies ahead. And finally, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. You want to underline that right there, heavenly prize, because that's what makes sense of it all. Sound problems again. Why, why do we press on? You press on because there's something ahead. There's a heavenly prize. Paul does not describe or go into detail about verse 14, what that heavenly prize is. But I can promise you this. It's better than what you're going through now. It's better than anything you're going to experience here. It will make sense of everything you've walked through. And when you get there, all that glory will be worth it. He says, I press on to the end of the race. He compares it to a race, kind of like in the opening video Zamparini did. He says, life is a race. This is a race. This thing you're running, it's a race. And you got to move. You got to keep going. 
And sometimes you're going to get knocked down. But you got to get back up. You don't stay down. You get up and you keep moving. You don't let life bring you down. You might get knocked down again. But you get up and you keep moving. And you keep going. And you keep moving forward. And notice, you run your pace. You run your pace. Your pace is not going to be his pace or her pace. You run your pace. But you keep moving. Because there's something waiting for you at the end. The heavenly prize. Glory. See, you need to understand everything that you're pressing on and pressing through has a purpose. The fact that Paul tells us there's something at the end tells us that all of this has a purpose. It's doing something. Every chemo drip is doing something. Every shot, every pain, every sorrow, Every tear, every difficulty, every amount of suffering that every one of you but one in the room said you don't want is doing something. It's part of the plan. They are the ingredients that make up the prize. And that's why he says, so you press on. You don't look to avoid it. You don't stay seated. You get up, you press on, and you move through it because there's something at the end that's going to make sense of it and make it all worth it. So press on. There is a story about a kid who graduated high school. He had always taught with his dad. When I graduate high school, I want to get a new car. All right, we'll talk about, yeah, all right, we'll get that new car. And there, there was always the talk when I graduate high school, I'm going to get a brand new shiny car. So the day came, the boy graduates high school, and he gets all worked up. He is waiting, he is expecting. There's a party in his name and his honor. And dad comes up and the boy's just waiting for this, these keys to this brand new car. And the dad comes up and out of this box, this boy feels, well, okay, I mean, I, I know you can't fit a car in a box, but certainly in the box is a brand new a set of keys to a brand new car. And the boy opens up the box. And in the box is a Bible. And the boy pulls out the Bible, and immediately his heart sinks into his stomach, and he is filled with anger. And he looks at his dad, and he says, we talked about a car. He says, son, I know, but listen, the Bible, that is the guide for life. That's better than any car. This brand new Bible, I want you to read through this Bible front to back. Read it front to back. It will change your life. It will press on. Even when it gets hard, this is the thing that will hold you together. There is nothing more valuable I could give you than this. Than through the suffering, through the heartache, through the trial. When you fall down, you get back up, you press on. This right here, this is it. The boy takes the Bible out of the box. Throws it on the ground. And walks out of the party. Many years go by. He lives in rebellion against his dad. His relationship with his father is now fractured. The father continues to pray. One night, the boy, many years later, the boy who's now a man gets a call. His father has died in the night of a heart attack. They're planning the funeral. The family asks the son to read some passages from the Bible his dad gave him at graduation. He says, I don't. He has to go look for the Bible. Finally, in some packed up boxes, packed away in the attic, he finds the Bible that his dad gave him that day of graduation. 
He's flipping through it, trying to find some passages. And he comes to the end of the Bible where he finds this wedge. And he finds an envelope taped to the very end of the Bible. Curious, he opens the envelope. And inside is a letter that says, Son, it's dated the day of his graduation. It says, Son, if you're getting this letter, then hopefully by now you've read the whole Bible from front to back. You've endured, you've persevered. Life has beaten you up one side, down the other. Maybe in this last year. I wanted you to read it in one year. And you've made it. And you found that the pressing is worth it. You found that at the end of the pressing, there's something. There's a prize. And the boy looks in the envelope at the second sheet of paper. And there's a check for $40,000 to go buy a new car with a post-it note that says, call me and let's go get that car. Two out of four Christian, you can be broken, still be a blessing. You don't have to be there. You don't have to be a finished product. But God calls you to press on. Don't you stay in that pit. Don't you stay in the past. Don't you stay in the muck in the mire. You get up and you press on. Because something is waiting for you that makes sense of it all. And the example has been set by Jesus Christ himself. Many years ago, at the foot of Mount Everest, climbers went up. It was one of the first expeditions. They made the last base camp before they would make the final climb to the top. But the weather turned horrible. And all the climbers who had made it to that point turned back. They said, we can't make it. There were two left. This is a true story. There were two left. They said, we're going. We came this far. We are not turning back. And they continued to walk through the clouds to the top. They were never seen again. Their bodies never found. And to this day, it remains a mystery. And if you see the memorial that was written about them, you will see the last line will say, at last sight, when we last saw them, they were pressing toward the summit. May the same be said of us in every circumstance, in every situation. When last seen, When I last saw them, they were pressing toward the summit. Amen and amen.